Five goals scored on Brzezgala. Five goals scored on... Oh, what's his name? Paplinski? Bobrovsky! Of course. How could I forget you, old friend? Making their way the only way they know how. Let's just... Alrighty, folks, welcome back to another episode of Live in 5, baby, episode number 65 across your face. We are making our way into the end of November. It's hard to believe. As always, sitting across from my chin on the other side in beautiful, well, I would say, where are you, Ozzo? Golden Valley, Minnesota? Burnsville. Burnsville. Home of Brock Besser. Home of Brock Besser. So the captain sitting across from me in his office right now, folks, working around the clock for you, the people. That is Gage Azo Osmus, myself, Jay Swish over here in North Scottsdale, Arizona, to be specific. But folks, again, this is the 65th edition of Live and Five. Today on the program, Azo, we got Canadian royalty, Jay Onright, stopping on the program, stopping by the program, if you will. He was kind enough to take the call on his way to the TSN broadcasting studio going right to the panel he talked to us on his i guess weekday night commute uh it was pretty funny to talk to him he's a he's an absolute beauty isn't he what a legend that guy is i know it's great I, I don't know why but i thought the interview was just a little more like different and fun because he was driving to work yeah and it was pitch black like I know we're all driving to work in the morning when it's pitch black, but he's driving there at night and it's pitch black. I mean, can you imagine that? But yeah, what an absolute legend. He, he stayed with it, had great answers. Obviously, that's what he does. But yeah, that guy is a legend. Yeah, he was kind enough to take the call. And he's like, do you want to do it during the day? I have some time when I'm at home. And then I obviously go to, you know, the studio at night. And I'm like, well... How about, you know, it kind of works better for us, but then he kind of pitched it like, how about, you know, I could, or I could do it when I'm driving to work at night. And I'm like, well, that, that would be kind of cool to take the call in the car. I'm like, that seems more relaxed. It just seems like what Jay Onright would do. You know what I mean? Just uh-huh. take a call from the car, talk about the good provinces of Saskatchewan, Alberta. So that was an awesome chat. I think the people really like that one, Azo. That'll be obviously after the pre show. As we always do over here at Live and Five, we plug our YouTube page. That is at Live and Five 2024. Please go check that out. Like, subscribe. Again, those subs are going up. The likes are going up. Please, if you're going to watch, watch it on YouTube. Watch our chins on there. Watch our interviews on there. All of our shorts we post on our socials in terms of the short clips are on there. So go check those out. Folks, we are always brought to you by Mini Movers and Butter Golf. Mini Movers, obviously. The official moving company of Live and Five Butter Golf, the official lifestyle brand over here. Got the Forks hat on, Ozzo. I think we got about 10 of these left. Some dude from Watford City, North Dakota, bought six or seven of these. So he uh, he took almost a half dozen off us. And I think there's probably, I don't know, 10-ish left. But, I mean, these hats, as you know, they're a little bit of a different material than the normal Forks hats. These ones are like heavy-duty, actually, hunting hats. So yeah. You know, they're not just that fake camo. This is real tree camo with a little bit of moss tint. That's no relation to Randy. But these things are juicy, fellas. So go check those out at Butter.Golf. We got three or four other different hats on there right now. Joro, what do you think that guy – do you think he bought them as like a gift? Was he buying them for like a team, maybe as buddies? They're going on a hunting trip. What is your best guess there out of Watford City resident? Yeah, I would say what it's airing down to the point of the end of deer season, right? So I think it's like a lot of at least a a lot of guys in Wisconsin right now are doing a lot of duck hunting. So maybe he wanted to get his buddy a half rack in terms of a six pack or a you know half dozen of these hats and take them exactly what you said onto a hunting trip and and kind of go shoot whatever they were going to shoot. So you know Watford City, North Dakota, probably a good man. Obviously loves the forks, but Azo. I'm not bullshit when I say this. The company that I ordered these hats from, they don't make this real tree moss camo anymore. And I think I ordered at the time 48 of them. And I was planning on re-upping, re-upping, you know, every whatever, quarterly yeah. or every, you know, three, four months, whatever it was. And they got back to me and they said they don't have any of these hats left. So these are literally a one-off. I've been trying to look for different real tree camo. Obviously, there's other options out there, but mm. in terms of like the heavy duty ones like this. These are the last. These are one of one. So if it's you a want one, item. 
If you want one, Oswald, all I'm saying is is you got to get it now because they're yeah. flying off the shelves. You might not even want to wear it. If you do get it, put it in a case, put it somewhere special because they, they ain't making these anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to go over to the Bass Pro Shop and get one of those douchebag hats that all the TikTok kids wear. Remember when the Bass Pro Shop hat used to be cool? Yeah, and then everyone on TikTok started wearing it that's never hunted, fished, or even touched an animal before other than at the zoo started wearing them. And then it's like, all right, buddy, like, what, what are you doing? Like, take that hat off. You're not a, you're not a fisherman. Shut up. <laughs> you never ripped lips before, buddy. Yeah. Take that hat off. You've never even walked into a Bass Pro Shop. I know you went online and ordered that and got it delivered. Now you think you're nails and you're not. Yeah, you can't wear the Bass Pro Shop hat and have a pair of Vans on. It just doesn't work like that. You no. can't be doing that. You don't even you don't even know what ripping lips feels like, fella. But anyways, Ozzo, our last ad read before we get into the pre-show, as we always do. I had a couple kids up in Toronto chirping me for this ad read. It was hilarious. He was like, Swish, that Gladiator Therapeutics ad read, that's a tough one. And I'm like, well, yeah, no shit. Especially oh, yeah. on a Tuesday when we were recording. If I had a couple of drinks, it's tough. Oh, yeah. You've nailed it a couple times, though. I mean, you've gotten pretty good at it, but it is a tongue twister. I'm happy you're the one that reads it. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I'm looking at this email from May 22nd from our boy, Dr. George. And I always read it. I always pull up the email. It's pretty funny. So here it is, boys. Thank you for coming to the show in Toronto. Shout out to, well, I forget your names, but you are avid Live and Five listeners and Butter Golf guys and Mini Movers guys. They were asking about you, Ozzo. So here it is, folks. Are you tired of dealing with chronic aches and pains or neurological conditions? Gladiator Therapeutics offers a revolutionary solution using quantum physics to improve your health. Our devices use patent technology to admit far infrared light, stimulating cellular processes without heat. This can reduce inflammation, speed up healing, and enhance mobility. Clinical trials show impressive results, including a 400% increase in survivability in stem cells, accelerated wound healing up to 68% faster, and significant improvements in Parkinson's disease models. Wearable 24-7 without power, our devices can be a game changer. Visit www.gladiatortherapeutics.com slash contact little hyphen drgm to learn more and start your journey to better health today folks that is it not bad there azo what's up baby how you doing doing well man um it's officially cold in minnesota today it's kind of snowing a little bit i know it's been cold recently but you can feel it now um it's not too bad you know we're close to december but it is a little bit of a different time you gotta gear up for them i've, I've been seeing you know ads with those Carhartt full one piecers, like the full one piece. I don't know what you call them, like the like underwear, the, like the overalls, right? Yeah, it's like an overall, like under. You wear it under clothes. I was, I've been looking at them online, and I'm like, I, I might have to get these. Like, I'm, I'm sick of, you know, I don't want to wear the fleece line pants, but uh, this way, I think I can wear just normal pants with this full get up underneath, and they actually kind of look sick. Like, just take off the clothes after work and just wear this one piece around. It looks pretty comfortable. Dude, you should get custom mini mover ones with that, with the Carhartt patch on it. Oh, and that'd be nails. I would like one of those, too, if you do it. And if you did a tree camel or whatever color it was, like that, you know, burnt, almost orange kind of look. is yeah. kind of nasty. Or yeah. a brown, some of those with the mini movers. Dude, that that is such sick gitch. And then you can wear that. You take that one step further, and you wear it when you're skiing. And then, like, you know, the last... Oh, yeah. Maybe like the last weekend at Big Sky or Jackson Hole or some of these places in Colorado. Then you go nothing under it. You go tarp off, and then you just wear that one piece in there. And yes. You look nasty on the hill. Yes. And just the, the overall gitch get up. How sick is <laughs> yes. that? You always see those guys out there. Oh, yeah. That, uh, there's so many. It, it, it is. Uh, I was looking at it, too. I was like, it's kind of just sick style. Like, I was thinking, I mean, that is a great idea, Jordo, going out there on the ski hill wearing that. But – what I was thinking was like, I hope, you know, I just hope someone, you know, I got, I got my Timbos, you know, out laid out right now. So like I can put them on at any point. I'm just hoping someone rings my doorbell and puts a flaming bag of shit right in front of it. So I can step outside in this one piece in my car or in my Timbos and fucking step on it and put the fire out. Yep. And maybe Gabby can yell at me not to put it out with my boots. And I'll just... <laughs> Don't tell me what to do, devil woman. <laughs> devil woman. Is that from, was that Billy Madison? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. He called his shit poop. <laughs> <laughs> 
that is an all time scene. But yeah, I, I, I like that idea. I like that get up. And you know what? That's actually nasty style. So maybe mini movers is on to something. Azo, what do you got cooking this weekend, though, baby? You staying put in mini? You moving, shaking? What do we got on the tap? I'm going to stay put in mini this weekend. I actually left town last weekend, as I, I think I mentioned um, on the show last week. Went to Sioux Falls. I'll kind of touch on that first. Went to Sioux Falls, had a great night or a great weekend. I got there on Friday night, Jordo, and um, I was trying to keep up with the big boys, which was a huge mistake. And you know me, I'm a competitor. Yep. So I'm like, these guys aren't going to fucking order another drink, and I'm not going to order one. So, yeah, I'll take another one, too. And, yeah, I'll take another one, too. And, and before you know it, um, yeah, I was a little – I got a little too – it got a little out of hand on Friday night. So, but uh, we got the drinks going early on Saturday and golfed all day. I think we played a little over 27 holes. And uh, it was an unbelievable weekend. I am also technically – I don't have any nuts anymore because I put my one nut left on the line that the Sioux boys would take a win, uh, which they didn't. Uh, I watched, I actually watched both games. I liked their effort. That Denver team is in a goddamn wagon with an absolute unbelievable coach and David Carl. I don't know what he's doing up there, but um, yeah, this weekend I'm just going to take it easy, Jordo. I got nothing on, on the, on the schedule. Yeah, first off, I want to touch on that Sioux Falls weekend, and then we'll get into David Carr because he sent me a funny message. So what were you drinking on Friday night that maybe led to you having to go get a, a whole new get-up on Saturday, if you will, head to toe in terms of a, a new set of gits? Because uh, were you drinking whiskey? Were you drinking beer? What, what happened there? Fella? It was actually uh, – yeah, I was actually I, – I got a – I ordered – so who I was with there ordering rum and Cokes. So yeah. I was like, all right, I'll take one of those. And she's like, well, we're serving them up with uh, Sailor Jerry's. And as you know, if you, if you've ever, if anyone's ever drank Sailor Jerry, it's a little bit stiffer than your Captain Morgan. Um, and when you're drinking them, you don't really know it's a little stiffer than the Captain Morgan. So I think that's what got to me was just underestimating the Sailor Jerry. Dude, Sailor Jerry's is insane. It's like a hundred proof. Oh, and it's, it's like fifty percent alcohol. Yeah, it's it's it was. I, I like usually if I drink Sailor Jerry, I can taste it. Like it tastes like straight eighty-seven unleaded gasoline, you know, and it's yep. it's stiff. But I I wasn't. I was I was kind of riding high, you know, as just excited to golf the next day, and I wasn't. I I, I was not a professional that night. I, I I didn't know my limit. I just kept her going. Wanted to keep up, like I said, um, high ego there. Wanted to, didn't want to, didn't want those bigger boys to leave me in the dust. But uh, ultimately, that's what they did. That new outfit looked good, though. The, you know what I mean? You, you, Sick new fit. Out, new, <laughs> Thank God all, for shields. I was gonna say that was almost a win in itself. You got that new outfit, you know, because you don't you didn't lay the newspaper down like Big Daddy before you pissed yourself. But I want to touch on just David Carl because. I texted him before the weekend, and I maybe got a little overzealous. I maybe got a little cocky, and I said, hey, how much nicer is the Ralph than old fucking Magnus Arena? And he texted me back, and he goes, it's way nicer. But you know what? I'm not seeing the return on the investment. And he goes, five titles for Magnus, one for the Ralph. So we left it at that. And then Azo, as the weekend ended, all he texted me back was, Six points leaving the Ralph. So it's just like, all right, all right, DC. I see how it is. But that, but you watched the games. I didn't because I was up in Toronto. And before we get to that, I just wanted to ask you, how was it? It was Friday night. I heard the boys maybe didn't compete as hard as maybe they should have. And then on Saturday night, the the effort level was there, but ultimately just wasn't able to get the results. Or how did you see it? Yeah. You know, 15 Sailor Jerry's deep, at least on Friday. Yeah, I thought on Friday we could have played better. Now, here's the deal. I'm not making excuses, Jaro, but we're missing our probably our top forward in Cam Berg and a couple of our good defensemen. Now, the defenseman that stepped in I thought played well, but this was just a really fast-paced game. Um, and I thought, honestly, Saturday could have went either way. It just – that Denver team, man, this, this game that I've watched all the UND games up thus far – this series was like, it was like watching a tournament game. Like the pace of play was just so fast and so competitive out there. It was really fun to watch. Um, it just sucked. We couldn't pull out a win. Now that, that 
that Denver team, I don't see them losing too many games this year at all. I, I probably maybe four or five games all year, and then someone's going to have to get lucky to beat them in the tournament. Wow. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, they haven't lost yet, right? They're undefeated. No, confirmed. they're 12 and 0. They're, they're unbelievable. They're such a wagon. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, UND, they got a little reset weekend. It's kind of like the old Appalachian State. You invite them in, you kick the shit out of them, hopefully in Robert Morris, and they can kind of find their footing right now because also UND right now, I believe, is five and eight, maybe. I mean, five, five and six. Five and six. Okay. So not perfect there. And the boys kind of got to get going in terms of, you know, right into the Christmas break and then the second half takes over. So I, I do think they'll be all right, but two sweeps before Thanksgiving. I know it's Denver and the other weekend was Cornell and those are two good teams in the pairwise. So it doesn't hurt a ton, but anytime you get swept, you know, it's, it's not perfect. So hopefully no. they can kind of find their footing a little bit and go from there. Also my weekend up in the chin of Toronto that show, man, was insane. Those people, they were throwing shit on the stage for us to sign. I ended up wearing a chew can on the top of my head. I mean, it was insane. I think Hockey Night Scottsdale might need to hire a guy like Jake Vegan to be our security guy or something like yeah. that. Because, you know, I'm, we're not saying we're the Beatles over here, but it was uh, it was pretty crazy in terms of the kids. It was all good. It's just, uh, you know, sometimes when you have Sounds, again, well, and those kids, you know, they're, they're, they're younger than 21 at the bar, right? Like yep. they didn't drink pretty early and they're young kids. And I think when you're drinking like that and you're at a show like that, you're almost looked at nothing against you guys, Jordan, but you're almost looked at as a fucking zoo animal. It's just yep. like, oh, we're, we're going to fucking, we're going to fuck with these guys. Like, I don't give a shit what happened. Like, they're just throwing shit at you. Like, what, what's, what's going on here? There's a bunch of drunk young Canadians that are just, this is fun. Like, let's throw a couple of fucking, let's throw some shit at the fucking entertainers here. Like. I'll make right. it funnier. <laughs> right. Yeah. They were throwing shit for us to sign. So they were throwing like chew cans. I signed the kids a pack of darts. There was the hats. There was like, <laughs> and there was the bar there. There was no like control. And you're sitting up there like, what is going on? But, you know, all the kids and the majority of them, they were all great and they were funny. It's just like, holy fuck. This was like a scene out of Wolf of Wall Street when you know, Leo's up top kind of pounding his chest. But it was good, man. We went to the game too afterwards. Saw that game it was a good tilt. Obviously. That one hit, though, oh, my God, on Darnell Nurse and Ryan Reeves. Did you catch that hit, fella? I saw that in real time. Oh, my God. In a rare instance, when you're leaving the trapezoid, as you know as a defenseman, you have to go chin up, and you have to scan the ice. My one thing on that hit, Ozzo, was, okay, so if you're Darnell Nurse and you get that puck that's reversed back to you, okay, so you get the puck that was in the right corner initially and it goes into the trapezoid, and you're going to round the net to the left side. And as you get that puck in the trapezoid, the net is your friend. So at some point, you can use that net to almost shield you a little bit. Mm -hmm. He picked that puck up on the yellow in terms of right along the wall, and he goes one Mississippi, two Mississippi, and then picks his head up. And at that point, Ryan Reeves is actually stick on stick, and then obviously wants to finish through the shoulder, but tags him on the chin. I just think in hockey, there is no onus on the puck carrier anymore it's a victim mindset and yes you don't want to see a guy get absolutely tattooed like that and with ryan reeves's history it's tough to argue that you know if you do miss a spot on the shoulder and you take him in the chin and especially with his history of suspensions he's gonna get five games when i once i saw it i was like oh that's that's probably five games for reeves but at some point don't you think darnell nurse as a guy making nine in a hook and you're getting that puck that's reversed, you have to know who's on the ice, number one. And Ryan Reeves had been on the ice for about at least 20 to 30 seconds, and you know him playing right wing, he is going to be the F3 high, and he's going to reload on the other side of the net. So he's the guy at the top of the circles. He's going to do a little bit of a turn, a silhouette turn, and then come downhill, and you got to expect to get met on that other side mm -hmm. of the net. To me, Darnell Nurse, pick your fucking head up, and also – Know who's on the ice. Like, you can use that net as your friend. Like, you don't yeah. have to just sell yourself out like that and just get fed. I wanted to get your thoughts on that because I saw that in real time. I was like, holy fuck. I mean, Jorah, it certainly looks bad when you when you obviously watch the play, but you're 100% right. Like, there needs to be some, you know, like, you have to take responsibility for your own actions sometimes. And when you're going to, when you're going to wheel around the net, especially like you said, when we say it all the time with a guy like Ryan Reeves on the ice, you got to know that stuff. And I know Darnell Nurse knows that he's a big, strong guy. He gets the physical part of the game 
And I bet he just kind of underestimated Reeves out there. And, you know, he made a slight mistake. Now, I do think you should have to pay for that when you're doing that in the NHL. This is hockey. This isn't soccer. This isn't basketball. You know, you know what you're signing up for and you know you're going to get crippled if you're if you're turning that net with your head down. Now, obviously, in the in today's in today's day and age, um, when a guy gets bloodied up and his head gets hit like that and it does look bad after, you have no choice but to suspend the player, right? Like that's just the world we're living in right now, which it sucks. But I guess those are the rules nowadays, so you do have to know those rules as Reeves. But I honestly thought it was a great play by Reeves too. Like stick on puck, hammer the guy, show him like – that's your job too. Like Reeves is supposed to be a big mean guy out there that, I mean, like it or not, he's supposed to be out there to kind of injure guys. Like I know we're not out there to injure guys, but he's out there. That's his job. So I don't know. It sucks that it is a suspension, but in today's game, it, it is, especially when he's, you know, his face is bloody after his buckets off and it's uh, yeah. I mean, you just got to know who you're on the ice with at all times. You can't take a shift off. No, and like we said, we don't want to see anyone get hurt over here. And It's, uh, it's fortunate that Darnell's only going to miss, I think it was five to ten days from his coach, Chris Knobloch. But I just think when you're a defenseman, okay, and you play in the National Hockey League, you're playing a gladiator sport with contact and fighting. How do you not know who's on the ice, like I said, number one? And if you're going to leave the trapezoid, Ozzo, that was the one area of the ice you should always have your head up Mm -hmm. with the puck as a defenseman rounding that net because that is the old classic peekaboo play, right? Where the forward baits you in to meet you on the other side of the net and bam, he hammers you. You always have to be scanning the ice and usually – before you get to that midline of the net, you want to take a look because the goalie ends up getting in the way a little bit kind of screening. So before you get to the middle of the trapezoid in terms of the midline of the net, you should be looking up ice, scanning where it is. Where is the most dangerous four checker to me? Okay, I'm usually going to have one guy on my back, so I'm not going to be able to make the cutback play. If he's not there and I have a little separation, Where's the next wave of pressure coming? Well, it's probably coming down the other side of the net on the dot line or a little bit inside of that. And once you get to where Darnell Nurse got to, right along the goal line, just about at the dots or a little bit inside it, you have to know you're going to be met with pressure, and especially when a guy like Ryan Reeves is on the ice. So I I just thought it was bad awareness. I thought there has to be a little bit of onus on and responsibility on Darnell Nurse Again, Reeves did miss his spot where he was trying to go shoulder on shoulder because he did have the stick out. He was going stick on puck, and he was looking to probably finish somewhere in the mm-hmm. midsection of the shoulder or the chest, and he tags his chin, and obviously Nurse shaken up. But I was sitting in a box, actually. These guys were kind enough to invite us up to, and I'm like, oh, my God, did he get tagged there. Oh, that did not look good. <laughs> And I, Jordan, you probably know, you've probably been in this situation before too, but sometimes you do just ultimately end up underestimating the guy on the ice too. Like sometimes when I saw a big bruiser like Reeves out there and I was getting a puck in the corner and I I thought maybe he was tired or so, I'd be like, this big dumb idiot ain't coming all the way down here to hit me. Like he's, <laughs> he's too tired or can't make it, you know? So sometimes you do underestimate those guys. I don't know if Nurse did that, but um, – it just kind of seemed like that to me. Like, how do you not have your head up when Reeves is out there? Coming yeah, down in the it just seemed way too casual for yeah. the clientele on the ice. And you reach, I'll teach. That's what Ryan Reeves said. Ozzo, let's stay in the National Hockey League first before we get kind of moving on to different things. Jim Montgomery packed his shit. He was fired from the Boston Bruins. They started off 8-9-3, and three, I believe, to start the season. Crazy to think that Jim Montgomery, who was a Jack Adams finalist, about a year or two ago, is now not coaching in the National Hockey League. He's a great coach, dates back to his Dubuque days, obviously won a championship in Dubuque as well as Denver. Guy's won everywhere he's gone. I think he's going to win a Stanley Cup someday, and I know him a little bit personally. He's an awesome guy. I just think this move to me, first of all, they were still in a wild card position. They're very capable of still making the playoffs and making a run. Now, the key additions – 
And some of the, I guess, Jim Montgomery falling on the sword had to be done because a guy like Elias Lindholm, Zadorov underperforming, Swayman obviously hasn't gotten up to the level that they would like to see his game at. Now that starts back to missing camp, contract negotiations. I mean, at some point, Ozzo, don't you think Neely and Don Sweeney, Seabass and Sweeney, you got to look their own selves in the mirror and say, you know what, maybe a little bit is on us. Maybe the personnel we have right now is just not meshing well together. And you know what, it, it just sucks because usually in these situations, Who's the first to go? It's the coach. It's not management. It's not the mm -hmm. players. It's Jim Montgomery having to fall on the sword. And maybe the Boston Bruins did need a new voice. But to me, firing Jim Montgomery, going to Joe Sacco, who's had virtually no success in the NHL as a head coach dating back to his Colorado days, it seems like a very lateral move. It seems like, I don't know, Azo, you let a really good coach go. Before that, they let a really good coach go with Bruce Cassidy. He ends up winning the Stanley Cup. I wonder your initial thoughts. Did you what'd you think of the move? To me, I just thought it was yeah, a little I, a little early. I I think obviously sometimes in professional sports, any 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 sport, you do need a new voice in the room. No, that's understandable, and that's just the way professional sports are. Like, as a head coach, you get hired to get fired. Everyone knows that. But at the same time, you know, I'm just thinking, if I'm if I'm the management of the Boston Bruins, I'm like, okay, I got, I got Jim Montgomery as my head coach, Jordo. How many other teams have a better head coach than I do right now? <laughs> Not many. Not many. Not I mean, there, there ain't many. Now, one, I don't think your roster is that good. I just don't. I'm sorry, but you guys ain't that good. No. You know, what he's been able to do with that roster the past few years has outperformed what I think they have on that team. So, for me, it just does, doesn't make sense at all. Now, I mean, they, they still have a chance to turn it around, too, Jordan. It's, we're, we're really early in the season. It's not like the, it's over. It's It's – I just thought it was a panic play. I think it's dumb. Um, I don't, from what it sounds like, Jordan, I don't think that the players wanted him gone. So it's like, well, I, I just don't know what you're doing. You know, what are, you, what, what are the odds you're going to find a better coach than that? Not great. Yeah, I know. And it, it's weird because it would be like, okay, if we have a coach teed up, say a guy like Joel Quinville, they're not going to bring Quinville into Boston because of what Boston's done in the past with signing guys like Mitchell Miller and having mm -hmm. a little bit of baggage from the woke culture that they've kind of ignited. So they already have a little bit of a rehabilitation image in terms of who they can go get. But to me, if you're going to fire Montgomery, okay, he's a top five coach in the league in terms mm -hmm. of not only what he knows and his knowledge, but how big of a player's coach and how much guys like playing for him. We know that. Yeah. We know Monty. And you go to a guy like Joe Sacco. Okay, Joe Sacco, his record at the National Hockey League level as a head coach, 130, 134, and 40. Jim Montgomery, 180, 84, and 33. So you're, you're firing a guy that is, I would say, probably right now is at least a top five coach conservatively. Like there's going to be teams yeah. lining up to go oh, get Monty. And now you know another I mean? team's going to have him. And now That's you got I mean. to play against them. It's like, I, I just, I don't understand the play, honestly. And there's, you look at their, you mentioned their depth. You mentioned their just roster and who they have. Okay, they got Elias Lindholm. That's their number one center. They were thinking he was going to be like a Bergeron or Krejci. This guy, to me, Azo, he was played pretty decent in Calgary, played solid in Vancouver, but he was playing behind a cast of superstars. Elias Lindholm is not a number one center. At best, he's a number two. Okay, then you have Pavel Zaka, who I think in an inserted role, if he plays with Pasternak, he can play as, as a two center. He's decent in that role. I would say on a Stanley Cup team, he's probably a number three. And then you have a guy like Charlie Coyle, who is at least, you know, at, at best, sorry, I would say a two, but probably a number three center. So you have mm -hmm. two third line centers and maybe one second line center. And you gave Lindholm all this money to be this new face of your down the middle, you know, distributing the puck and play with the high end players. And it hasn't really worked because, again, Lindholm is a guy that is a secondary scorer. You have Pasta struggling a little bit. Marshawn coming off two surgeries. A lot of different things there. They fumbled it with Swayman. So, I'm just thinking, when is some of this going to fall on the management? 
and Don yeah. Sweeney and Cam Neely because you know those guys were feeling it from Jeremy Jacobs, the owner, and they, you know they were feeling the outside pressure from the fans in Boston, and I think they made a panic move based on that. And I don't know if they're going to realize what they let go until it's too late. I mean, you look at Butch Cassidy, he went and won a Stanley Cup. I think Jim Montgomery is going to find his foot footing somewhere else, mm -hmm. and he'll be pretty good somewhere, Ozzo, because that guy is a great coach. Oh, yeah, he'll definitely end up somewhere, and I bet some team right now. If I'm if I'm a team in the league, I just even if I'm having a decent season, I'd fire my coach and hire him right now. I mean, it's just he's, he's taking them a good season, so I just – I don't understand the play at all. I, yeah. I'm, if I'm if I'm Monty Jordo, I'm pumped. I'm like, get, get me out of here. Give me a give me a little bit of roster, a new start. Like, see you later, boys. Have fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm kicking my feet up, and not only are those two week checks still hitting for about a hundred k, maybe a little more. I'm just kicking my feet up. I'm hanging out. I'm watching the league, and I got the pick of the litter. Literally, if it's going to be this season, or maybe it ha might have to drag out to the summer. But at the end of the day, Azo, I'm still getting paid, baby, and I'm going to end up in a good spot. Where do you think Jim Montgomery – I don't know where he would end up, but I, I just have a hard time believing it would be in a bad spot. Now, I wouldn't want our boy or my boy, Derek Malone, Newsy Malone, to get fired in Detroit. But mm -hmm. imagine Monty going in there with that roster, shaking things up. I think he could do damage there. I think there's a lot of spots Monty could go, and I think he'll just sit back be patient because that guy is going to be in the league again. Yeah, yeah. I think Monty will be patient, and he'll probably pick which team he wants to coach next because he will have his choice. Yeah, 100%. So, Jim Montgomery, you're going to be all right. Speaking of being all right, Ozzo, I hope this fella is all right because he's been tucking at an alarming rate, but it sounds like the great eight, Alexander Ovechkin, is going to be week to week. Looked like a knee injury. Looked like some sort of leg contusion. He got tangled up with Jack McBain of the Utah Hockey Club the other night uh, after he potted a hat trick. So hopefully Ovi can be all right. It's crazy that Ovi, when he comes back, Azo, could actually get the goal record done in less games than Wayne Gretzky. I mean, think about that. Not only is he going to break it, but I think think there's a pretty good chance he could get it done in less games if he stays on this rate. I think he's 31 odd goals away. I mean, this guy, he's one of your favorite players. If you're not your favorite player, just touch mm -hmm. on the grade eight. We hope he's going to be all right week to week. So who knows? Just, you know, maybe get a little Russian gas, get a steroid shot, yeah. something, and he'll be back out there. But fuck, man, he he's playing it back like it's 2010 right now. Oh, he's he's scoring at a higher rate than he ever has right now. Um, I mean, obviously a knee injury right now at the age of 39 is really scary. It sounds like he's week to week, so it's not too serious. Now, I don't think Ovi's a big rehab guy, but then again, he's got a little bit of Phil Kessel in him, Jordo. He's only missed, I think, what, 35 games due to injury throughout his whole career. I mean, the guy just, he doesn't really get injured, so it's scary when he does. Now, I think he needs, what, 29 goals in like 44 games to beat Yep. Wayno's record for you know less games now that would be insane to do at that at this point though Jordan I'm watching the way Ovi's scoring his goals his release and his shot is it hasn't fallen off at all he can keep doing this for how many years as many years as he wants I mean I see him getting to a thousand tucks yeah I mean the thing with him and we've talked about it before the way he can score is he just posts up in that office yeah. and he gets open. And nobody can stop that. No defenseman has seemed or been willing to block that shot. No goalie, even though everyone in the arena knows it's coming on the power play, Obi's over there on the left flank just absolutely tickling the ceiling and cocking one-timers. So the thing with him is, is he'll always be able to score that way because the shot's going to stay the same. I don't think guys like McDavid – or even, say, other elite or prolific goal scorers in the league are going to be able to do this to the age Ovi is because, you know, McDavid, the legs will go at some point. You're not going to be able to skate like that until you're 40 years old. But with Ovi, when you can just straight leg it over there and just tickle the ceiling with the lasso, it's pretty it's, easy. Why would you not want to have that guy on your power play when he's 50? He doesn't even have yeah. to skate. Like, he could be sitting in a wheelchair and still score those goals. It's insane. 
Yeah, it really is something. And it's so funny because there was a guy uh, that, that actually played in Hershey for a long time, and I'm not going to name his name. He's still playing hockey somewhere in North America. And he would always tell me we would skate in the summers together. And he'd be like, you know what? Every time I get called up, I'm a defenseman, but I'm a left shot. And I would purposely in practice and even in pregame skate, go play the right side on the penalty kill, just hoping Ovi would either hit me somewhere in the foot, somewhere in the leg, and just break my leg or break my foot or hit me somewhere where I'm going to be out a little time. Because as a seventh defenseman, I'm not going to play a lot. And I might get sent down any day now, but if he hits me and I break something, now also I'm getting paid for at least the next six to eight weeks at NHL salary versus my jungle salary. So he'd always used to tell me that. He said they want him to wear the blockers in practice yeah, no. on the feet, and he'd be like, no way. No, no way. I, I can't skate with them. I Just can't wear diving them. in front of shots in the yeah. mock PK in practice. <laughs> yeah, he, he said they would be in pregame skate sometimes, and they'd be doing the walkthrough, and he's still trying to get down and big and block OV shot. <laughs> It was all that's time. Unbelievable. That's, yeah. that's chess, not checkers, folks. Yeah, he's like, anything, you know, for a couple more hundred grand. I don't give a shit. I'm not going to play anyway. I'm going to be in the press box where I'm going to be, you know, getting taped up medically, and I'll have to do just some rehab circuits. So, yeah, it was it was so funny. He'd always tell me that, but all time. So, Azo, let's move over to the National Football League. I'm heading to the chin of Pittsburgh today, and we will be watching with the Missing Curfew crew that Mike Tomlin Pittsburgh Steelers team versus mm -hmm. the Cleveland Browns. We're going to be at the William Penn Tavern on Thursday. So I am going to start us off last week, my picks in week 11. I took my Green Bay Packers. Ultimately, they won, but they didn't cover. Good teams win, great teams cover. They won on that last second missed field goal by the Bears kicker. Tails oldest time, the Packers piss pounding. They're redheaded brothers to the south in the Chicago Bears. So that was a great win for Packers fans. Fortunately, I wasn't able to cover Thursday night. Hopefully this drops before so that people can hear this. But I'm going to take the Steelers minus four because I will be watching that game at a bar in Pittsburgh. So I got to ride that one. Obviously, minus four just seems like not too many points no. for a matchup against the two and eight Browns. So I'm going to take that game, Azo, And then I'm also going to take... The Detroit Lions, minus seven on the road. You have to. Indianapolis, Dan Campbell, favorite coach in the league right now. That's minus seven. They're nine and one going on, facing off in Indy versus the Indianapolis Colts, who are five and six. That game, 11 a.m. Mountain Standard on Fox. So those are my two locks of the week. We'll see if they come to fruition. But, fellow, what do you got? I like that. I was looking at the board, Jonah, that Steelers at Browns. That is the best game on the board. I think that's a lock. Yep. Um, but what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the Bears at home plus three and a half against my Vikings. I don't see the Vikings winning more than three. I actually see them possibly losing this game. They just have never been good against the Bears, especially at Soldier Field. So that is the game. There's no way they're going to win by more than three if they win this game. So that's the pick for me right now. Yeah, I like that. I love a couple locks there. Azo, I wanted to give some love to Dave St. Peter, friend of the show. He's been on the show last year before, well, this regular season started. He was in spring training. Dave St. Peter is ultimately calling it quits with the Minnesota Twins. He is retiring from Major League Baseball in terms of working with the Twinkies. 35 years with the Twins, Azo, UND grad. Bismarck, North Dakota native, best friends with Mike Schmaltz. These guys were actually down here in Arizona this past week doing their yearly golf trip. So a bunch of Bismarck boys hanging out in the desert. But I just want to give a couple clicks and some love to Dave St. Peter, who is obviously stepping down from the Twinkies. He was the president for the last, I don't know, 15, 20 years, maybe even more than that. But a guy that when we talked to Azo worked his way all the way up from the pro shop at the Metrodome all the mm. way to the big boss, the head honcho, the president of the organization. So, man, what a run for St. Pete. Not sure what's up next, but whatever he does, I'm sure he's going to crush it, whether it's in a consulting oh, role, yeah. working for the league, maybe giving back to UND. I'm not sure what St. Pete is going to get up to next, but, man, what an awesome guy, Bismarck guy, humble, and, uh, you know, just – one of those guys that always went out of his way to not only help the student athletes, 
making the transition into the real world at UND, mm -hmm. but just a guy that, you know, helped a lot of people and be successful and, and just kind of, sure. you know, give them their advice. So it's awesome. What a cool story for, for Dave St. Pete. Too. I mean, that guy is an ultimate legend. The, just the way he worked his way up, just put his nose down and went to work every day. Um, he was curious about his job. He always wanted to do the best he could. And then he ultimately climbed the ranks. And I know some Minnesota Twins fans um, aren't, as, aren't exactly always pumped with the Twins player signings and all the, the you know, what they do with the team. Now, Dave really had nothing to do with that. That's the general manager's job. He's the president. He had to make sure, you know, the ball club was making money. They were selling tickets. They were making the right decisions as a business. And he did a one hell of a job with that team and what he was given. I think, you know, they always had really good fans at the Twins games, which wasn't always easy some of those years with some of the players and teams they had. Um, so, yeah, just an unbelievable career by that guy. One of the coolest. He was, like you said, Jordo, he helped out. He used to help out student athletes, you know, students try to um, – going into the real world, trying to help them, you know, with their careers. And he actually, you know, I reached out to him when I was done playing hockey and I, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was trying to meet North Dakota alumni. And he was one of the guys who messaged me back and took a meeting with me up in his big penthouse office at the target field. Um, definitely something he did not have to do. I can't believe he gave me the time to do that. Um, so it's just really cool. Like him doing stuff like that. It's just unbelievable. It just speaks volumes to his character. And like you said, I mean, if he ends up, I'm sure he's made enough money where he doesn't really have to do anything else the rest of his life. But if he ends up somewhere else, I mean, whoever gets him will be more than lucky to have a guy like this. And, and, you know, I don't know if he goes back to UND or helps him with something because I know he loves his school there, but and I, I don't know. I'd throw the I'd throw the house at him if I was UND just to get him in as a consultant or whatever, just to have the guy around because it's just, you know, he doesn't even have to have a title. Just having him around his next and, and his expertise and just talking to him would be so valuable for that university. Yeah, hundred percent. And you mentioned it, just taking the time of day. He is going to stay on, I think, with the Twinkies just for the transition. They're selling the team. I don't know if that's public knowledge but they will be transitioning into new ownership. So I think he's going to stay on, help that smooth process or, or make it a little smoother than it is and kind of just be, you know, an eye in the sky in terms of giving out life advice, business advice, and just making that transition a little easier on the new fellas running the regime. So a couple of clicks for St. Peter. He's a good man and a good chin out of Bismarck, North Dakota. Azo, we're going to go over to the one hitters with the captain. And this week I have an ultimatum for you, my friend. Okay, so this week's one hitter with the captain is a question that has frequent my mind a lot. It is always a deal breaker with couples. It's married couples. It's PTOs. It's gals girlfriends, boyfriends, whatever. Okay, Azo, so now I'm going to ask you this question here. If you live 30 minutes from the airport, okay, so I think 20 minutes is safe. That's no big deal. But if you live 30-plus minutes from the airport in a bigger city, we're not talking about the small towns where you can't get an Uber, this and that. If you live 30 minutes away plus from the airport, should you or your gal offer to Uber or should you always be expected to pick her up or get picked up? So if you're flying in mm -hmm. and you live 45 minutes away, are you expecting Gabby to be there ready with the car running to pick you up? Or you're like, hey, baby, you know what? I'll just Uber. Maybe it depends on the time of day, this and yeah. that, or even getting dropped off. What are your thoughts on this? Well, I think I think this one's an interesting one because there's no right answer, but it's very situational, Giorgio. It depends on the time of day, what you what you're doing, what day it is, the circumstances. Your friend, how old are you? You know, is this a PTO? Is this your wife? Um, there's just a lot of things that go into it. Now, I don't agree with the people who think like, oh, if you're not there to pick me up, you don't like me. You know, like that's. I think it's situational. It's like, okay, if I got time and I got nothing to do, 
maybe I'll come pick you up. You know, if I got good gas mileage on my car, I'm driving a 2,500 pickup truck. It might be, it might be more financially um, economical for me to maybe get that Uber. Um, so it just depends. Now I'm a big Uber guy in that sense. Like that car ride sucks. I don't like car ride conversations in that sense either. Like the 30 minute drive kind of in traffic too, if you're in a city or whatever, just grab the Uber and then I'll see you at home. It'll be a much better conversation when you get here rather than in the car. It's always awkward. Do I get out? Do I give them a hug? Um, do I not? Do I stay in the car? If I stay in the car, when they get in, do I give them a kiss or do I say hi? Do I turn down my podcast that I'm listening to or my music or do I keep it on and just act like, you know, I just saw you yesterday or should I act like I missed you? I don't know. There's a lot of things going on there in my mind that I just, you know, if I if I were to pick Jordo, I'm, I'm staying home and I'm ordering that Uber, especially if I'm able to afford it. Um, now, I'd say if you don't have a lot of money and you're a young college kid and you, you're driving a little Camry car, you should probably go pick her up and save that 30 bucks. But, um, again, it's very situational. But and you make a good point there. It should never be looked upon as you don't love someone because you no. don't go and pick them up or drop them off. Like that has nothing to do with it. Sometimes no. I actually physically don't have the time yeah. to do the hour and a half round trip. Or I just simply think – it's a little bit easier if you, hey, maybe you save me a little time on the back shift because, again, I'm going to have to wrap this thing around and drive back. Or maybe if it's rolls reversed, you're going to be wasting time too. And there's nothing wrong with just getting in that car. Again, if you're financially well off to soak a $30 Uber per se. It's just like mm -hmm. I think it it gets mixed up of you don't care about me enough or love me yeah, enough. Yeah, that's when the that's, part that bothers that's, me. That's not it. That's that's not the point. Like we can, no. can we can we put these feelings aside for a minute and just rationally think about this. That is always the thing that I think I hate to say it, but women factor in versus dudes. Like I don't have feelings. I actually kind of like just getting in the Uber as long as like I oh, it's great. Fucking talk to me. Now, yeah. if he starts talking to me, that's another story. That's a nightmare. But I actually like the peace and quiet just to sit back there, maybe send some emails, some texts and get caught up on some different things versus, you know, bringing in the feelings of it of like, oh, actually, you don't care about me. No, no, no. That's that's not it at all. It's just like, let's just get on our way here versus, you know, making that awkward kiss, yeah. goodbye, hug. And it's like you're thinking about the whole time. And then, you know, she says, I miss you 17 times. I'm going to miss you. It's like, baby, you weren't, we're not even there yet. And then you get out and then it's like, okay, well, do I have to get out like an Uber and then get that suitcase out? That's kind of a carry on size and then put the backpack on you and then, you know, get stuck in traffic. And then all of a sudden, do I walk you to the door or do I stay here? It's just like so many different things of like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Like, yeah. Can we just cut all that out? I don't like that. Like None of this means really anything to me. It's like, I mean, they're picking you up or I'm waiting and you're Ubering and either one, I love you the same either way. You know, it, right. it doesn't mean I like you more because I'm picking you up and it doesn't mean I like you less because I'm not. And right. that's the way I look at it. I just don't like when people look at it like, oh, you're not going to drop me off or pick me up. Like you don't like me. It's like, no, that's, that's not it. But let's not go there. Right. If I have the time and it makes sense. Yes. hundred yeah. percent. But sometimes situationally, you just got to get in that Uber and call that 1985 Toyota Corolla that somehow is considered an Uber comfort and get picked up there and it reeks like darts and there's Cheeto stains everywhere and just grind it. So that's all I'm saying, Azo. Azo, let's go over to the People's Insider term of the week, and that is Gitch. Now, I don't know where this term came from. I don't know how it even makes sense. I've tried to look up Gitch in Urban Dictionary. I've tried to look it up even in Webster's. You can't find the word. And the first time I ever heard it was actually a guy named Adam Waddell. He was our equipment manager in Sioux City, Iowa in 2010. Mm -hmm. He came over from the Easy Come, Hard to Leave League, and I believe previously with as an equipment manager. So, Adam Waddell, a.k.a. Wads, brings in this term called gitch. And I was thinking, like, what the hell does that even mean? He's like, yeah, put your gitch in the bin. I go, what the fuck is gitch? And it turns out that this term is actually a term not only in junior and college hockey and pro of putting your laundry in the bag and then putting it in the laundry bin for the equipment managers to do the laundry the very next day. And then they hang it up in your stall and you got your jock strap in there, your socks, your underwear, all of that in there. But the word gitch in hockey is a universal term. 
and I don't even know what it means, Azo, but mm -hmm. every equipment manager, every guy in hockey, and especially, again, the pro ranks, college ranks, and into junior know this term. And when was the first time you think you heard the term Gitch? Azo? Yeah, first time I ever heard it too, Jordan, was in Ann Arbor, my first ever junior season. And it was like one of those – it was like one of those times where, you know, you almost, you, you, you're not going to ask. Like when you hear them say, like, put your gitch in the laundry bin, I'm like, okay, I'm not going to ask what gitch means. I'm just going to try to figure it out by looking at everyone else and seeing what they do. And then you quickly find out it's your laundry bag or your loop that you put everything onto and they call it a gitch. Now, I don't know where this term comes from. I've always wondered where it comes from, Jordo, but to me, for some reason, it just makes so much sense to call it a gitch because what else would you call it? It's just a, it's a gitch. And yeah. It's, it's perfect. And I just Googled it. And apparently according to Google, gitch is a Canadian slang term for men's underwear. So maybe that's where it that's stems what from. It is. And yeah, the first time I ever heard it, I was like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Like, he's like, Hey fella, put your gitch in the bin. You left it out last night. I'm like, what, what is gitch? He's like, your underwear, your laundry loop, your bag, whatever you use, make sure you put it in the laundry bin over here so I can do your laundry. And I was like, gitch, like, I, I kind of like that word. So now, yeah. now my sister has gotten a hold of the term gitch. So shout out to Kylie. And she's always texting me like, yeah, like, you know, she'll walk into, we were in Munich and we were at the game and she's like, can I get some team issue gitch? You know, I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll get you some. So we got our pair of socks and different things. So she's always like, make sure, like, make sure you wash your gitch, you know? So it's just like, so that's the people's insider term of the week, folks, is gitch. And yeah, start using that. It's what the hockey guys say and yeah. throw it in there. And if you're in a men's league or all you beauties out there, yeah, incorporate that word. Maybe go up to your wife and be like, is my gitch ready for the 10 p.m. game? And she'll be like, what? She might even slap you. And she'll be like, <laughs> like no baby I, I didn't say bitch i said gitch it's my laundry and did you do it and she'll be like <laughs> i don't even know what you're talking about you sound stupid so use it say you got it from the boys at live and five but that is a universal hockey term for laundry azo who did you have for your nail gun of the week my friend yeah i had two actually one we already discussed alexander ovechkin the grade eight um Ultimate nail gun, the guy he's scoring, he's leading the league by two goals, I believe. I'm not sure if that still stands after last night. I didn't check, but leading the league in goals at 39 years old, just incredible to see what he's been able to do with his career, especially, you know, it makes sense why Connor McDavid and Sidney Crosby and Nathan McKinnon are so good at hockey, Jordo, because they're hardos, right? They that's all they do is eat, sleep, and breathe hockey, and that's all they're thinking about. Well, now, Ovi isn't like that, I don't think. And the part that I love about Ovi, too, Jordo, is he just – the last goal I saw him score, he got just, just as excited for that goal as he did his first NHL goal ever. Like, he's just so fired up whenever he scores. It's so nail gun. I love watching that guy play. And then I did have to shout out for my second nail gun of the week, Josh Allen the quarterback for the Buffalo Bills, game on the line, fourth and four, I believe, and he takes the ball himself to the house, 26 yards to bury the Chiefs and give them their first loss of the year. That guy is all time. I just love when quarterbacks take the game into their hand and go out and get themselves a win. So I had to shout out Josh Allen. Yeah, the old Chris Collinsworth. Now, now here's a guy. Now, now here's a guy. Talk about an old gunslinger, run the ball down the hill, not scared to get hit. So, yeah, that's uh, that's unbelievable. And I was given a little bit of a Gruden there. So I'm actually going to give Jay, sorry, John Gruden, who is now with Barstool Sports, throwing out absolute gold, everything I see. He's going to be my honorable mention nail gun i don't know if you've seen the clips Azo, but he's been oh, unbelievable yeah. i love when gruden is in the mix he is like a he's like okay. a white buffalo for me yeah. in terms of getting someone on the program at live and five and just being able to talk to him getting in the war room with a guy like gruden he's just a football guy did you see that one story he put out where his first job ever was working at the first hooters actually outside of tampa bay and he was working at Hooters. I don't know if he was a, a waiter or a bus boy, but he was a younger fella. And he got a job at Hooters. His dad was coaching in Tampa at the time. And it was time for 
John Gruden to go to college and he was going to go to Dayton. And he, I guess he was like begging his dad. He's like, dad, like, come on, man. Like, I don't want to leave this job. He's like, no, son, you're going to college. He's like, but I love it at Hooters. Come on. So <laughs> he wanted Love's to Hooters. stay working at Hooters forever. That was like his life goal at the time when he was 17 or 18 years old. He ended up going to Dayton, actually working at a Hooters outside of Dayton, Ohio. So I just think everything he says and just his enthusiasm and his charisma, like that's a guy that's just completely about football and oh, yeah. a guy that I would just love to talk to and have beers with. He's a, I, I just miss him, I, whether he's on ESPN he, or whatever. So it's good. He's to see all him time. Back. He's all time. And, and Portnoy, I listened to Portnoy share a story when he was when he was interviewing him for this position. Portnoy was actually like Gruden thought Portnoy was like a man who just traveled the world and like had seen so many things. And Gruden was like asking him like, "Yeah, Chicago's such a cool city. Like, it's where do you go to eat here? And like, what do you do here? Like, it just seems like such a good city." And he's like. The whole time I'm thinking, like, this guy coached in the NFL for, like, a long time. He's been to Chicago multiple times. This guy, I realized when I was talking to him, when he was coaching football, he never left his room. He never saw any city. He just went hotel room studying football to the stadium where he coached football, and then he'd go to the airport and fly back to his place where he'd just watch more film. So it's just unbelievable. I love when guys are that passionate about something. Um and especially the football guys, because they just have, you know, their character is just, it's 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 something that can't be matched in any other sport. Yep, I love that, and I love Gruden, so it's good to see his chin back in the mix. Azumite nail gun of the week actually goes to a pickleball player that was playing in a tournament outside of Mexico City, I believe, somewhere in Mexico. I don't know if it was Mexico City, but a guy celebrated on him. I think they closed out the game. He kind of threw his paddle off the way or kind of knocked it out of his hands. And as the guy was reaching to pick it up for him, the guy that was kind of celebrating obnoxiously went to pick up the paddle. He swatted from the other guy's hand, you know, doing him a gesture of guess. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Mm -hmm. Well, the fella on the losing team took, you know, pretty big account to that and, you know, offense and ended up, kicking him right in the chin, knocking him out and sending him into fucking next week. I don't know if he sent him to Guadalajara or Panama city with that kick, but that fellow was free falling like Tom Petty to the ground. And he said, he doesn't remember the next three hours after that, after he got no. kicked in the face. Oh yeah. The guy who got knocked out said yeah. that. <laughs> he was fully concussed. He was knocked into Panama city. Like I said, like just, just annihilated. I mean, talk about just having some moose knuckles on you and no one did anything. It's like the, his partner didn't even go no. approach the guy that kicked him in the no. face. He's like, probably that guy's a jackass. Fuck him. He deserves well, you it. Can, oh yeah. Well, you can't, you also, you also can't go after a guy that does this because you could tell the guy who kicked him in the head, Joro, that was just a reaction. He didn't actually want to do that. It was just his body telling him he had to, that's he was just a snap show and just, booted the guy in the face it, was yeah, was... it looked like he he thought the guy's head was a football and he was and he was pat mcafee trying to punt it yeah that thing was on an absolute t and he was like at the ladies tees just licking his chops and he was ready just to fucking nuke it because yeah he hit that thing like sebastian janikowski hitting a 60 yard field goal that thing was just i mean the snap back on that head too like you gotta be some sort of sick puppy to fucking kick a guy in the head, like it, despite whatever he does, I mean the celebration, whatever, obnoxious. But again, we're forty five years old here. Like you're just gonna kick a guy in the fucking face and knock him out, and then nobody did anything. Like they kind of just like you know almost went over to the other court, and like like kind of like shook oh, yeah. him up and hugged it out. So I was just like, wow, what a complete whack job that is. I just had to shout that guy out in a pickleball match because pickleball not only taking over the world, they say, well. They're doing it with some authority. So, Azo, should we send it over to Jay Onright from TSN? Let's do it. Folks, again, that was episode 65 of the pre-show. We appreciate you. As always, I'm off to Pittsburgh. Azo holding the fort down in mini. Tape to tape with you, Captain. Always no look. Crispy Rice. Fellas, until next week. That was Live in 5, baby. Woo! Now, introducing... The pride of Boyle, Alberta. Folks, this <laughs> gentle giant standing at a booming six feet six inches once set a record for the most drumsticks consumed at a local KFC buffet just outside 
Weyburn, Saskatchewan. <laughs> Folks, he did that in 12 minutes. He's worked Stanley Cups. He's worked Olympics. But there's no place he'd rather be than Earls on Main in Winnipeg. Folks, without further ado, please welcome Canadian royalty, Jay Onright, to the Live and Five podcast. Jay, how you doing, brother? What's shaking? I'm, I'm so good, fellas. It's great to chat with you. I've got you on my commute to work tonight, so you're following along with me on my commute. So hopefully I don't run into anybody. That is good, and like you are, you're going 10 and 2 there, so you're you're driving nicely over there, right side chilling, but Jay, what's up? You're going into the office right now, obviously, we're just coming off the Great Cup, so were you in BC, were you boots on the ground for the 111th edition of the Grey, or were you doing stuff in the studio just outside of Toronto? Yes, yes, I was in the studio. I hardly ever leave that studio anymore. They like to keep me uh, tucked in tight in Scarborough, but I heard it was a terrific time. The whole crew had a great time and uh, almost four million viewers on TSN. So, you know, the league's alive and well. I mean, we could definitely use a 10th team up here. So if you mm-hmm. boys have some some cash to scratch together for a team in Atlantic Canada, you would be uh, Halifax legends if you did it. Uh, we could really use a 10th team. But uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm happy to hear that the, the league is, is thriving and uh, and doing well up here. Do you, Jay, do you think the CFL has ever thought about maybe going to a five-down league versus a three-down? <laughs> because now we can get a little bit more offense, if you will, instead of just watching a punting match. Like, you got to be a good punter if you're playing the CFL because you're on the field about every 90 seconds, it seems like. Well, the theory is that, you know, by second down, you're throwing the football, right? So right. the idea is that in theory, you should get more passing plays. I don't know if that always is the case, uh, but yeah, it's, you know what, the thing that makes the Canadian game unique is the three downs, is the ruse, just getting it through the end zone, you get a point, right, which is hilarious. Yeah. And so generally, I think it's a good idea to keep these wacky rules because otherwise, then it's just American football and mm-hmm. Canadians love the NFL anyway, and they would probably just be, be drawn to that. But I think at the end of the day, those three downs still make it very unique. Chad Ochocinco played the CFL for a while, and he was so impressed with the talent level. So I think the league is still doing good. I just think, I just think at the end of the day, um, it's tough with nine teams. You know, we we need to have an even number of teams in this league. I think it would be. I think it would really make a difference, and I think it would be so much fun in Atlantic Canada to have an extra team. So we gotta we gotta find some money, fellas. I don't know how, but we gotta do it. Yeah, we gotta we gotta start selling it like the Chiefs. You know, we get the money and move down the floor to like the Charlestown Chiefs back in slap shot. But Jay, one name before we move on. The CFL that I absolutely loved was the gunslinger out of the Montreal Alouettes back in the day. And I was actually about 10 drinks deep the other night looking for a Anthony Calvillo jersey. Now, is there any way, you know, you could maybe help me find one of these? Or is that just, I mean, he was, you know, that that guy, speaking of Canadian royalty, he was a gunslinger up there for a lot of years. Yeah, he was was an absolute beaut and a really wonderful guy, too, really embraced Montreal, the Montreal embraced him. I love stories like that. You know, a guy like Anthony who grew up in SoCal, right? Probably couldn't find Montreal on a map for the first 23 years of his life. And then gets to Montreal and becomes an absolute legend. And they absolutely love him up there. And he's a terrific person. And I believe, and I could be a bit wrong on this, but up until at least last year, he was working for the Owls as a coach and a consultant. So... Uh, I will, I'm going to work on that for you. I'm going to I'm going to find you a yeah. Calvillo jersey because I feel like that's something you would wear with pride all around Scottsdale. So yes, I will I will task myself with making that my goal, getting you a beautiful number 13 Al's jersey, and we'll see if we can get uh, Anthony to even sign it for you. That would be great. Jordan actually Jordan. wears a Rough Rider jersey around, so he, he's already got a CFL jersey. He wears it proudly. Yep. Who, I have a, who, uh, who, is, uh, who is it? Well, I was gifted to it by one of my former teammates, and it was an effort from two Moose Jaw guys, natives, and Rhett Gardner and Colton Sanderson, Jay, who we played at the University of North Dakota with. And I was number 24, and, you know, I, I like to have a couple beers, and I still do. So the jersey is 24 <laughs> Pilsner name bar on the back. How Saskatchewan yes. is that? That is unbelievable. Yes. 
The official so, drink of Saskatchewan. It's not. It's not just a pilsner. It's pilsner. Yes. Here. Yes. <laughs> it's a pilsner. Yes. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. But oh man, Jay. Jay, I wanted to ask you, like, okay, so we're going to segue into, you know, just your career a little bit. Obviously, you came up through the ranks. You spent time in the good city of Winnipeg. You do have some Saskatchewan roots there, too. But the one tagline that I just came to to know you, and especially working with O'Toole over the years, was the old Bobrovsky line. Like, how did you start that tagline of Bobrovsky? How did you, you know, start just shouting out – Bobrovsky, you're off the case. Like that to me is what Jay Onright is all about. You know, it's so random and so bizarre how it came about because the story is always very underwhelming, but here it is. It was the fact that when he was coming up with the Flyers and eventually went to Columbus and I first heard his name, I was deep into Gene Hackman, 1970s French Connection, that kind of movie. The uh, the cop who is sort of a sort of a renegade, right? He he did things his own way. He didn't play by the rules. He had a sergeant who was really tough on him, but ultimately was looking out for his best interest. But sometimes had to take away his badge and gun because he didn't play by the rules. I loved cops like that. They always seemed to have like an Eastern European last name, you know, whether it was like a, you know, a Polish name or a Russian name or something. So when I heard Bobrovsky's name for the first time when he was coming up in Philly, it was just like, wow, this sounds like the name of a like Eastern European immigrant son who had become a Brooklyn cop and was just a little bit of a loose cannon, just didn't didn't do things by any other way but his own way and so it just sort of made me laugh to say his name it just sounded like something that a really tough sergeant would say like Bobrovsky you're off the case I'm gonna take away your badge and gun if you don't start to fall in line (laughs) and it just kind of I just kind of went with it and it just kind of went on and on for a long time and it was great and it was funny last year when the Panthers won the cup James Duffy, my colleague, was on the ice and he was interviewing Sergey and he was on live with me on my show while he was doing it. So he asked Sergey if he would if he would dedicate the Stanley Cup win to me because of all the fame and fortune that I brought to Sergey over the years. And Sergey said, I'm not going to do that. So (laughs) I think Sergey maybe loves me a little less than I love him, but that's okay. Every relationship's like that, right? Every marriage, uh, every every uh, relationship in, in the world is like that. So I'm fine with that. I don't know if Sergey loves it, uh, but at the end of the day, as you said, Schmaltzy, everybody seems to love it. So I keep it going to this day, and uh, and I'll probably keep it going until the day I retire. <laughs> I love that. Jay, Jay, there's millions. I wanted to ask you that there's millions of kids that would love to have your career that you've had so far. Is, is it, how do you climb the ranks with what you, what you've been able to accomplish? Is it kind of falling in line doing what you're told or is you kind of paving your own path and being creative? Well, I can tell you the, the way I was able to stand out a little bit, what happened was, I was behind the scenes at TSN, and then, as Jordan alluded to, I went out to Winnipeg for a few years, Saskatoon, sort of learned the ropes. And then I came back to TSN, and they paired me up with Jennifer Hedger, who, you know, is just this stunning model, beautiful blonde, leggy, cultish legs, beautiful woman. And I'm like a goofy prairie kid you know, 108 pounds, soaking wet, six foot six, just a gawky, (laughs) awkward human, giant forehead. And I'm sitting next to this model and I'm like, if I don't start to allow my personality to come out a little bit and start to express myself, people are are not going to pay attention to me at all. They're just going to be gawking at how beautiful my co-host is and how, and she's also a terrific broadcaster. So on top of being gorgeous, you know, they would just be marveling at how good she was at the job and how truly shitty I was at the job. Mm-hmm. So 
I just decided to let my personality come out. And I'll, I'll give TSN credit because, you know, I think they trusted me to not go too far with it. You know, at the end of the day, when Dan and I used to do the show, people probably thought we started off cracking jokes right off the start. But if you watched us right at the beginning, we were pretty boring. We were just kind of doing it pretty straight. And mm -hmm. eventually we both decided to sort of let loose a little bit. And that's how we become, we kind of became successful. Because at the end of the day, we wanted it to be a show that seemed like the kind of show you and your buddies would host, you know, like, like a show like this, basically, you know, a mm -hmm. show where it's just a couple of buddies sitting around talking sports. And that was our show. That was our podcast. That was everything. We never wanted it to feel forced. Our favorite broadcasters are always the guys where they don't seem like broadcasters. You know, our least favorite broadcasters are the guys who sound like one person in an interview. And then when they get to the broadcast, put on this ridiculous broadcast voice that just drives us insane. So we just wanted to be real. We wanted to be ourselves. We didn't know how to do anything else. We didn't have the talent to be anything else. So, so at the end of the day, just being ourselves sort of worked, you know, and, and it's yeah. probably a good lesson for everybody, you know, be authentic, especially in this day and age when there's so many things out there for people to watch and listen to and read. Um, being an authentic person, I think really resonates in, in any medium. And, and so that's what we tried to do. And that's still what I try to do to this day. Yeah. And I wanted to ask you, Jay, just in terms of your chemistry with O'Toole, I mean, it just seemed like you, like you alluded to, you were having so much more fun. And anytime I would come up to Canada, whether it was for a, a minor hockey tournament or even going to play a little bit internationally, it always just seemed like when I would get up there and watch TSN versus sports center down here in the States, you guys are just you take the governor off a little bit. It was more real. It was more of what I wanted to watch. And it was those taglines like you blew it. And then we go over all your mistakes throughout the episode or throughout the broadcast. And then it was like that is using your face. And it would be this guy just getting dummied in the face <laughs> by a ball or something. And it would be like, look at these guys. Or you have the Vuvuzela out and you're like playing it in O'Toole's ear. Like, how did yep. your chemistry was it did the friendship go beyond the broadcast and the stage where you guys having you know a lot of different talks of how can we make this more spicy or entertaining or funny or was it kind of just in the studio because i imagine even making the move down to california with fs1 like you guys were like i mean you were basically brothers at that you were a package deal you know so i just wanted to kind of get the the background of just how you know you guys were like basically it seemed like you were like brothers it seemed like the you know relationship oh, went further than just what we saw on on air absolutely and still is to this day and i think that was a huge part of it you know and, and you you know you mentioned something there that made me chuckle silently when you said did you plan things out we planned nothing out we planned <laughs> we planned zero we we never pl planning was like our least favorite thing meetings are our second le least favorite thing we we got to Fox and it was like seven meetings a day and we wanted to pull our hair out because we love to be spontaneous and everything that we did was pretty spontaneous. For example, you brought up the Ablua thing that that evolved from the fact that we were doing the late night shift, like the 2 a.m. show at the time, the show was 2 a.m. to 3 a.m. Eastern time. <laughs> so we we get through this show and like we'd make all these mistakes and then the show would loop in the morning just like it did back in the 90s on espn our show still does that right so we would if we screwed up we would have to fix the mistakes for the loop in the morning and the crew would be so pissed off because we'd screw up all the time because we're not good broadcasters so <laughs> at some point we decided you know fuck this let's just own up to our mistakes at the end and then we won't have to fix anything. We could just leave and go home. <laughs> and, and that's exactly what we did. And we came up with it like on the spot and people loved it. And I think what they loved was one, it's just two goofballs goofing on everything. But also I think people appreciated the fact that we weren't trying to pretend we were perfect. Uh, we, were, we weren't trying to pretend we were great at this. Uh, and we were just making it a little light and a little more fun because at the end of the day, right, guys, sports is entertainment. And it's not supposed to be as serious as people were taking it or as late. That was the way we felt about it. You know, at the end of the day, I wanted a show where if you were getting home from the bar or you were waking up in the morning and heading to school, you were a little kid. 
either way, you'd be able to relate to us, right? Whether you're a college kid or you're a little kid, you know, to this day, I get so many people coming up to me saying, I grew up with you. And that's all kids who are, you know, grown up in the early aughts, uh, having their cereal while watching us before they headed to school. And that makes me feel really fucking old, but that's okay. That's good. That means it worked, right? <laughs> that means it worked out. So yeah, it was, it was, uh, even to this day, Dan and I still talk every day. We're still super tight. And I knew right away the first show we did together, I was like, I can work with this guy. I had worked with enough people in, in this industry, guys, that I didn't get along with or that I didn't think were great that when I met Dan and it was good, I was like, I got to, I can't screw this up. Right. Like we yeah. got to appreciate how good this chemistry is and we got to milk it as long as we can. And that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Jay, I wanted yeah, to ask you the body issue. Now you did a knockoff sports illustrated with Fox <laughs> and I wanted to ask you, did you go Cal Naughton Jr. and Talladega <laughs> Knights? Did you go full spread for Playgirl magazine or was it just <laughs> The frontal side, because I didn't see any of that game film. But when I was doing my pre-scout on you, that came across my ticker, and I was like, yeah. "Oh, I got, I got to ask Jay about this." So, how did that go, fella? Was that, uh, you know what I mean? Was that pretty funny to do that? It was fun. I can tell you, it was not full frontal. I would probably have been okay with full frontal, and we were so outrageous in those early Fox days that I'm surprised they didn't have us go full frontal. Yeah. But I digress. I remember the shoot. I We were living in L.A., and for whatever reason, my wife and I decided to go to El Matador State Beach in Malibu the day before, and I made the mistake. I did the old put on the sunscreen and then get into the water and then lie down on the beach. And so the sunscreen has been washed off your body in bizarre and weird ways. And so... I get home and I've got this sunburn that's like patchy all over my body and it's just disgusting. And then I realized, oh, tomorrow I've got to show this body off for a Sports Illustrated, fake Sports Illustrated thing. So if you look closely at that picture, Jordan, yeah. you'll see like some real patchy spots. Like you probably thought I had lupus or something, but it was just a bad sunburn. Yeah. And uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm pretty shameless. I, I don't have a lot of shame. I, I don't consider myself a physical specimen by any stretch, but I'm happy to goof on myself for the, uh, for the entertainment of others. So that was a good example of that. That's unreal. Jay, did you have to adjust much to the L.A. lifestyle? Being from Canada and living in Canada your whole life, that's got to be a lot different. I mean, did you miss Canada when you were down in L.A.? Or were you happy to be in the States? I loved it, loved living there. I thought, I think people in LA, just that, you know, I'm talking about the, the, the gang behind the scenes, right? So we worked with some great people, like in front of the camera, great athletes, wonderful broadcasters. Everyone was great, but the people that impressed me the most were just the regular Angelinos, the, the, the regular folk who were behind the scenes that were so nice, so welcoming to us. I'm just merging out of the 401 here. Here we go, beautiful. And um, they were just so friendly. Like, people think Canadians are friendly, and we are, but we're more polite than friendly. Mm. We're, we're actually pretty passive-aggressive. <laughs> For sure. Right? And, and whereas I find Americans are just more open. You know, they're, they're, more, um, they're more welcoming in a weird way, you know? And so we just got along with everybody right away, and I love living in the city. I mean, how can you go wrong with 72 and sunny every day, right? It's just great. And... Yeah. And Fox treated us like gold. The show we were doing was a disaster. Uh, you know, I knew like two days in, I was like, this is not going to work. Like, this is not good. Uh, nobody's going to watch this. So it was weird, right? Like, as you yeah. go to work and you'd be like, I don't know if this is working. But then I get home and I, I was living f five blocks from the beach. And I was like, I don't really care. I'm loving life right now. <laughs> yeah. So so it was good. I, I've got nothing but good things to say about everybody at Fox. They treated us like gold. And uh, it just didn't work out. I think at the end of the day, the thing with FS1, we didn't have the live sports inventory, right? We didn't, we were still showing Big East basketball guys when we started. Like we were showing stuff that nobody was tuning into. So I, I don't know that anybody could have made a difference. And the only person who made a difference to that network was Skip Bayless. You know, say what you want about Skip, 
but it wasn't until Skip showed up that FS1 finally was was on the map. You know, he was the one who really got the the ratings that they needed. So, you know, I give Skip a lot of credit. Quick Skip story, I'll tell you guys. When I first yeah, yeah. met him, I'm, I just ran into him randomly at, at Fox. Like, he was just in the hallway near the makeup room. And you know how it is when you meet someone? And, like, I wasn't, like, a huge Skip fan or anything, but I'm a polite Canadian. So, you know, I went up, I, I introduced myself. He's like, oh, I know who you are. I love you and, and Dan. And, you know, when someone says, gives me a compliment, instantly I'm like, oh, I love you too, Skip. And he replies, no, you don't. And I thought, man, that's... <laughs> I thought, that's pretty fucking self-aware. You know, I was pretty impressed with Skip. Yeah, no, that, that, that's funny. Hey, was uh, was Shannon Sharp there at the time, too? Or do you did you get a little taste of Unk? Obviously, what he's I doing did. with Nightcap and, you know, a little bit of leak game film, if you will. I mean, I love their podcast. <laughs> I love Ocho. You mentioned him earlier. But did you get a live look into the Unk that he's become? Or was he more buttoned up in those days? More buttoned up, but really... You know, just one of those guys that, like, kind of commands the room, Hall of Famer, yep. physically so imposing. You're just – you're shaking his hand. You're, like you're, – you're not going to feel any feeling in your hand for a week. He's so strong. And he's a super nice guy. And – but I will say, guys, I did not see this coming, you know, with him kind of taking things over right. with Club Shay Shay and all that. Um, you know, when he came in, if you guys recall, when they started Undisputed, it was Skip's show, right? It was full on Skip and Shannon was sort of the co-host and, and he, it could have been anybody, right? Cause really Skip had been with yeah. Stephen A for so long. They were looking for a replacement and Shannon was the guy, but, but Fox, I don't think appreciated what they had in Skip and, it's pretty obvious because he's gone on to, to great things, not just with the podcast, but obviously on now on ESPN, he's fit in great there and Skip's gone now. So, so I think Fox definitely did not see that coming just as I did not see it coming. But uh, yeah, I got all kinds of time for Skip. I think he's, he's hilarious. Yeah, for sure. And I just wanted to ask you, Jay, now we touched on it in the intro a little bit and we're going to make our way over to the good province of Saskatchewan. So yes. what is the fascination behind the buffet at the Kentucky Fried Chicken in Weyburn, Sask? Is that a place that you confirmed have been boots on the ground and got your drumsticks, maybe your wings and thighs? Or is that just a place that you kind of always shouted out randomly when you were on the broadcast? No, very much a place I've been to many times. My parents grew up in, uh, near Fort Capel, which is maybe an hour from Weyburn. And, you know, covered the Red Wings, covered the SJHL. And the buffet is legendary because I don't know in Canada if there's a single other KFC buffet. Now, people have told me since then that there are a bunch in the States still. <laughs> but I don't think there are any left in Weyburn. And it's so important to the culture and the fabric of Saskatchewan, of the 306, that when the owner tried to finally, I think about five years ago, convert it back to a regular KFC, there was an uproar. Like there was an actual <laughs> uprising of people who said, you cannot take away uh, this macaroni and cheese, this electric green col coleslaw, uh, this gravy that is sort of a jelly, not so much a gravy, but a, but a mold. Uh, you can't take this away from us. We want as much as we want. We want to be able to scoop this up ourselves. So I give the people of Weyburn a ton of credit, Schmaltzy. I think they really stepped up for their KFC buffet. And it's just something that Dan and I have been fascinated by for a long, long time. And I just love Saskatchewan. You know, the, the province that's um, hard to spell and easy to draw. Yeah. Just wonderful people. Nothing but rock solid tough farm kids who will come to the chell and fight anybody like the shen brothers i just love the place and every time you go to saskatchewan you have a good time it's like atlanta canada yep. we used to do our show live across the country we would do it on like a stage in front of like five six thousand people and the best stops were always the atlanta canadian stops and the saskatchewan stops because those people in both those parts of the country flat out refuse to let you leave that town unless you are completely polluted and possibly on death's door. 
<laughs> well, Regina, Saskatchewan is the city that rhymes with fun, as you know. You exactly. know what I mean? Right? So those, oh. like, you know, you, you go there and, you know, you're never going to have a bad time. My last question for you, Jay, and I think probably ozzo has got one more for you, but I just wanted you to shine some light on Darren Dutchin, obviously a good man at the good just country of Canada and, and all over sports loss in this last year. I just wanted to, you know, you know, open up the door and, and just, you know, shed a little light on that fella because, you know what, he was always a great, you know, broadcaster and telecast, whatever he was doing for TSN. So I just wanted to, uh, you know, give a little light to him as well. So it's funny you, you uh, asked me about him right after I talk about Saskatchewan because he was, you know, born and raised in Porcupine Plain, Saskatchewan. Yep. As sasky as it comes, right? And and I here's a quick little story. I grew up in Alberta, small town Alberta, and by the time I was uh, 15, 16, Dutchie, as we like to call him, was a host in Edmonton. Uh, he was a sports host in Edmonton. So I kind of grew up watching him. And the thing that instantly he was like a huge star there. And the reason was, you know, sportscasters before Dutchie were really buttoned down. He comes along, he's got a full-on mullet, just like we all had at the time. He's cracking jokes. He's just a total goofball. But it's the delivery, right? It's like it's the he shoots, he scores. Like, it's just so <laughs> unique and bizarre. And everyone loved him instantly, and I idolized him. You know, I, he was the reason I got into the biz. I, uh, I had a chance to meet him early on when I decided to go into, into the business, and he was – just so enigmatic, but he, he commanded the room, kind of like Shannon Sharp. You know, like he just commanded the room. He told great stories. Everybody loved him. And uh, it's a massive loss for TSN. Everyone's pretty devastated still to this day. So, yeah, I'm glad you asked me about him. He was a huge influence on me and, uh, and a huge reason why, why I decided to get into the biz. And he was one of those guys who, who made it seem like it was acceptable to be yourself on TV. Right. Like to mm -hmm. to to let yourself come out and just be you on TV. And that might resonate with people. That was Dutchy in a nutshell. And uh, that inspired a lot of us for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, Jay, I wanted to say thank you for coming on. It's obviously uh, unbelievable to be able to talk to you. But uh, I'll keep this one. La this last one short. Did you cheat on that November mustache you have going there or was that? <laughs> Did you did did you start clean shaven from November one? I gotta tell you guys, this is the worst one I've grown in like twenty years, and it's not that it's not coming in thick, but my my whiskers are so gray right now that it's not showing up on camera. So I'm sitting next to Luke Wilson, total stud, former NFL tight end. I'm on with him every night. He's growing a beautiful chestnut brown duster. Meanwhile, mine looks like Dr. Phil if Dr. Phil, you know, had the flu or something. Like, it's, like, so patchy and white. So uh, this might be my last one. But to answer your original question, yes, I did start it right from November 1. We've been doing November for, for a long love time, that. ever since it started. And we love doing it. We love all the money it raises for lots of great causes, prostate cancer research. Uh, mental health, all that great stuff, you know, that, that needs the money that we raise for it. So we're happy to keep doing it. But, yeah, fellas, I, I'm going to have to start getting out the Just for Man and combing it in because it's getting yep. embarrassing at this point. Yeah, because you yeah. used to have that almost like Paul McClain like duster, you know what I mean, where yes. you come off the top rope and it would always be like the walrus. Jay, 100 you know I mean? percent. That one I grew, that was that, exactly, it was like Craig Stadler at his peak. Yes. I, I was like full on. I was, I was, Dan used to get so mad at me because I'd grow that and he'd grow this wispy little thing. And now it, it's all come full circle. I'm growing this one that looks like, I don't know, Chris Christopherson when he was on his deathbed. And, and Luke is growing this lush that looks like Burt Reynolds when he shot Smokey and the Bandit, basically. So <laughs> I got a lot of work to do, fellas. It's either it's either just for men or that Grecian Formula 16 that Rocket Richard used to comb into his hair. Yeah, and you know what? I used to even I used to go jet black just for men, Jay. And I'd actually take it to the point when I was still playing a little bit, and I would tickle in a little bit of Sharpie. Now oh. it's just to paint the front porch. You don't have to go full down to the bare knuckle of the skin. But yes. just a little bit, just to keep you honest, you know what I mean? It's not full spray paint, but that at the end of the day, 
is a permanent marker. So that was my dedication always to my duster. So, you know, you know, I kind of had that uh, Pedro like from Napoleon Dynamite look. You know what I mean? It was, it was very clean. So, you know, I, you've inspired me. I got a ton of Sharpies on the desk at Sports Center. Uh, I love the way they smell. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Right. And I love to take a whiff once in a while. Yep. So I may have to try that tonight. I like your advice, and I may have to take your advice and give that a go tonight. We'll see how. It yeah, goes. yeah, yeah. Let me know if you know if you ever get bored up there and, and just give her a go. But Jay, the Great Cup next year is in my favorite city in Las Vegas. That is Vegas of the North. That is Winnipeg, Manitoba. So hoping to get up there and probably you know wearing at least three or four different layers of a Canadian Goose jacket and probably nine to ten Fireball shooters in my pocket. So if I'm up there, I'm gonna have to give you a holler, brother, because. Uh, one of these years, I got to get it off my bucket list in terms of going to the gray. And I would say, Jordan, that that, that would be a great one to go to because yeah. the peg is, as you know, you know this, and I love that you have an appreciation for the peg and, and the Earls on Main. It's it's uh, it's Canada's Portland. Yeah. It's it's artsy. <laughs> it's fun. It's quirky. Uh, everybody there uh, is on drugs for eight months a year while the snow falls. <laughs> yep. Um, it's just a wild town. The great music comes out of there. Great artists. It's it's a quirky, fun town, and that would be a great, great cop to go to. So I, I hope maybe we can both make plans to try to meet up there, uh, yep. hang out at Earls on Main, hit up the Palomino Club, All uh, right, the go pal. to court in Little Italy. Like, just just have a great time. We'll get Nick Ehlers out. We'll get Lowry. We'll get all the boys. And I'm already getting fired up about it just talking about it. There's something to be said getting kicked out of the shark club before 8 p.m. You know what I mean? That That's how drunk you are. <laughs> Sir, did you just piss down your leg? No, I actually pissed on the guy who's sitting right next to me. But I'm going to double this up. So uh, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. So. Sir, good night, and uh, Earl's on Main, six blocks to the west. We'll let you in, so just go over there. <laughs> oh, no, we can do this Earl's all day, brother. I, it's a, oh, yeah, yeah. It's a, there's, there's everybody who lived in Winnipeg or spent a little time there has an Earl's on Main story. It's funny how, just really quickly, Earl's in western Canada, west of Winnipeg, is a very different vibe than Earl's in eastern canada like toronto the earls are like nightclubs basically yep and in the west they're kind of like family restaurants and in winnipeg it's a little bit of a split it's a little bit in between you can bring the family during the day but when the sun goes down you better get ready to rip it up with several albino rhino pints because earls on maine will get you yeah, you better have your fight strap on and your chin tucked past the hour of happy hour because who knows what's going to happen after I have a dozen kokanees and we're doing a little bit of white Russians on the side. So, yeah, you're, you make a great point, fella. No, it's uh, it's awesome for you to pop on, though, Jay. You've always been one of my favorites dating back to, again, you know, watching you come up to the ranks and snapping it around with O'Toole and, and then going down into here in the States with FS1. So, man, this was, uh, this was a bucket list one for me, and thank you so much for coming on. This was awesome. Guys, you really appreciate it. Thanks for joining me on the commute. We're almost at work. It timed out beautifully. Perfect. perfect. Yeah. Have a good show, brother. And, uh, you know, further down the road, maybe we can do it again. But that was awesome. We appreciate you over here at Live and Five for popping on with the fellas. Making their way to